Hi, welcome everyone. Um, this is part of a larger conversation series between the Blueprint Artist and Black Girl Loves the Bard. And our conversation topic is pretty exciting. It's witches and spirituality. I feel that it's very timely um, considering it's almost Halloween. Um, and let's get started with introductions. So my name is Mimi Lamb. She, her, hers. Um, I currently live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, AKA land of Monty Lenape. Um, I uh, will be the facilitator for this conversation. Um, and yeah, and we have our guests with the three witches from Mackers and also Magdalia, who um, is the translator for the Shakespeare play, which is pretty exciting. Like Macbeth is one of arguably the largest play plays in Shakespeare and she translated um, Macbeth into modern English in three years. So I think that's very impressive. So, I, so I'm very honored to be in this space right now. Um, and um, let's, uh, I'm gonna pass the baton to Migdalia and um, who can introduce herself. Okay, hi, I'm Migdalia Cruz and I'm so happy to be here to talk about which is another beautiful things um, from the play Macbeth and in my translation of that play. Um, and I'm a playwright and I'm uh, calling in from Irvington, New York, which was once had the much more beautiful name of Wekis Kick, which was, it's a, they're like a family offshoot of the Lene Lenape um, that are people mainly think about when you think about uh, New York City. So I'm about 30 miles north of New York City, so. Um, that's how quickly tribes changed and how itinerant the tribes of the Lene Lenape are and how widespread. And I'm happy to think about the tribes that will come after us because I think what we're doing is not so good, but um, hopefully uh, life will continue. And I'm going to pass it to Jasmine. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jasmine Boone here. Uh, she, her, hers. Um, I am in Queens, New York, which is also part of the Muncie Lenape uh, land. So just excited to be here, excited to talk all things witchy and a little bit of like spirituality. I love it. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Marissa. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, I'm Marissa Stewart. Uh, she, her, hers pronouns. I currently live in Manhattan, uh, which is the land of the Lenny Lenape and Wappinger. Um, I am, we're supposed to say our roles, right? I am witch three, uh, servant, messenger, woman, uh, Lady Macduff. I think that's all of them. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it to, also, I'm really honored to be here. I'm going to pass it to J Rock. Peace, y'all. I am J Rock, aka Jessica Raquel. Uh, she, her pronouns. I am currently in Georgia, which was once the Muscogee land. Hopefully, I'm saying it correctly. And I play um, Murderer 2, Witch 2, Menteeth, and Young C Word. And I'm very excited to be in this space. Woo. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. So I think we can all say that we all come from different backgrounds and cultures, especially very different from Shakespeare and his time. So I wanted to ask like, what thoughts come to mind when you read, when reading about witches and spirituality and Mackers? Like what, what are your first thoughts? I always think of like the word conduit, um, uh, thinking of oneself um, as being a conduit for something much more natural. Um, I don't know, it feels like being like a root in the earth and kind of allowing something to flow through you that maybe people don't always understand or let something blossom that people might not really understand until it's really seen or materialized. Um, and I also think about Tichiba. Um, uh, I think about her quite often um, and just uh, how much uh, I call upon her, in, especially in this work, and um, just making sure that I make space for her and knowing that I am part of her line is beautiful. I 
I, the first thought for me, ironically, are musicians. I don't know why, just whenever I think of uh, sorcery, witchcraft, voodoo, anything mystical, my first thought is like, how can I connect this to music? And the first song I heard was, uh, oh, shoot. It's, um, dog on it. I know it's a song for Ilegua. And that, that was my first, and it's this like six part harmony and it's beautiful. So my first thought was just like voices, harmonies, creating this sort of sorcery, magical music. Yeah. Mm. Okay, forgive me if I go on a little bit of a tangent here. <laughs> um, but for me, as far as my roots go, uh, I remember growing up and my mother, who's from a small island called Karakou, uh, which is off the coast of Grenada, which more people might be familiar with, um, she would tell stories of uh, spirits and people who practice black magic, a type of magic called obi in the Caribbean. And it's a spiritual practice that can be used to, you know, ward off evil or possibly bring harm to others. It can also be a source of comfort to displaced Africans in that they could rely on um, their own for healing or protection. Um, and practitioners of Obi, um, they would be known as either an Obi man or Obi woman. And they're believed to have to be born with a special gift special powers that are passed on from generation to generation um, and that they would be, you know, endowed with Obi. Um, so my mom, she would tell me and my sister these stories about, you know, ghosts that were, that have appeared and that people had seen and then people casting spells and one person casts a spell and the next day, you know, a volcano erupted and it's because of the spell they cast. Um, you know, sometimes she would refer to it a little bit like, um, voodoo which is more like haiti terminology um or kind of like revengeful magic i guess um and it obi is a type of magic that's practiced throughout the west indies um so i want to also talk a little bit about the lens that my mom had as well as her family uh you know she grew up in a really really catholic household uh, so when she spoke with these people that practiced Obi, you know, it was very much from a place of gossip, um, like, oh, could you believe, you know, maybe there's a little bit of like, sh trying to shame others a little bit with it and less uh, re reverence regarding it. Um, and for me, I'm actually really fascinated by this, uh, particularly because, well, it originated in West Africa. And when Africans were taken to be enslaved, those that practiced Obi would use it as a form of resistance. So there would be these rebellions that would happen throughout the Caribbean with uh, the person who practiced Obi in the center of it. They are the leader behind it. And people would fall in line with them um, because they're endowed with this magic. And if they follow them, like hopefully their rebellion, you know, whatever their, their, their rebellion could win. Um, so much so that rumor had spread and um, the Spanish and the French would actually try to avoid taking Africans that practiced Obi because they didn't want to have to deal with rebellions or any sort of revolting. Um, and something that, you know, for me that I have a deep reverence for also with, with this is that, um, you know, that they they use this as, like I was saying earlier, as, you know, a form of their own protection. Um, you know, being taken from their home to be enslaved it was something that they could lean on. Um, and to me, that speaks of just like resiliency, which takes me to my next point. Sorry if I'm talking a lot, um, which is my favorite, favorite quote ever. Um, well, one of my favorite quotes, I'll say that. And it's, you know, one of those quotes where you come across and it like takes your breath away. And I saw it at the Women's March in 2017 in New York City. Uh, a young woman was holding it on a sign. And the quote is, we are the granddaughters of the witches you weren't able to burn. 
I see some of you have probably heard it before. I love this quote so much because to me, I know, right? To me, it signifies a power that all women have, right? The power of resiliency against the patriarchy, against misogyny. We are still here. We're still standing together. We're only going to grow stronger as, as we move forward in time, right? So this idea of resiliency and strength being passed on, this idea of like generational strength, legacy, um, almost evolutionary, evolutional strength. Uh, you want to go into Darwinism? Um, but to me, that uh, that's why I love that quote so much. And that's also why I'm really interested in, you know, in Obi um, from the Caribbean is just, again, this idea of resiliency and the idea that it, it, it is passed on, right? And that um, I have the resiliency that my grandmother had, that my great-great-grandmother had. Um, so anyways, that's what I want to share. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, Marissa. I, I love that. Uh, we're we're going to talk more about resiliency. We should. We're going to unpack that. Um, Medalia, how about you? Um, you know, I'm just, it's, it's funny. When I think of witches, I think of family. And, um, and I think that's what we've all been saying. It's part of like, um, it's a part of our ancestry and it's a part of uh, the resilience of women. How do, how do we, how do we heal? when we work outside of traditional forms. Um, I, I, for instance, I put a, a, a little bottle with water in front of uh, my kitchen window and I put a curse on it so that if anybody breaks into my house, they'll be cursed. So the idea, and I, and I got this idea from one of my aunts, um, but she was like an aunt by marriage. And she was like sort of the local, um, what would you call her, clairvoyant? psychic she I mean she also pierced my ears she did a variety of things in a, in the in the neighborhood that was about um healing and and uh and service to the community um prayers but she also talked to the dead and uh and I just and she was just like in this amazing woman Doña Clara so I when I was so when I think of witches I think of her but I don't think of witches I think in in the traditional way that we think about you know, weird hags that are going to cast spells on you and kill you. I think about women who heal you and sometimes have to do it in hiding because they don't want to get killed. Um, that quote that that, uh, that Marissa just gave us was so beautiful. I never heard that before. And it's the witches you couldn't burn or wouldn't bur- couldn't burn or didn't burn. Witches you weren't able to burn. Weren't able to burn. Okay, I'm going to write that down. That is so perfect. I feel like witcher, witchery is 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 womanhood <laughs> in a really basic way, and I think I come from Puerto, my and my, my my people come from Puerto Rico, but I also have people that came from the Canary Islands and from Ghana and from all these other places that I feel like they brought all kinds of religion, like all the Yoruba gods came with them, but that's Nigerian. So how did all these ideas of of who is your god? You know, who are your, who do you worship? Who do you, who protects you? How do they all end up in the Caribbean? And what does it mean to all of us to have been, have had that part of our family or of our history and, and never really, people really, really talk about it necessarily. Just like, well, you know, you got to do this. And you're like, okay, I'll do that. But you, you almost, nobody ever knows the, the way back history of what that is. So for me, being, being a witch is being a, uh, a human female that, that recognizes the power of their ancestors and of the gods to sort of um, for help them fulfill their destiny, you know? And I, so I think it's a very human thing as opposed to a very, I don't think of them as supernatural. I think of them as um, in a way, hypernatural really about the natural world. Yeah, so I think that's, that's what I think about witches. Uh, I love that. <laughs> okay. So why don't we do a reading from Mackers, um, since we have all three voices here. Um, let's start off with Act 1, Scene 1. Um, and it's just the first page. And then we can read Act 1, Scene 3 um, afterwards. Um, yeah, and I'll give, you, give a, a signal of when. Hmm. 
When will we three make a king? Now the storm outside comes in. <laughs> Scotland's sun rising as it sets. What one gives is what one gets. <sighs> when will we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. Before the setting of the sun. Where the place? Mm -hmm. uh, upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. Oh. <laughs> I come, Gray Malkin. Oh, bad it calls. Soon then. Fair is foul. And foul is fair. Hover through the fog and the filthy air. Hmm. Hey, that was great. Um, and now let's do act one, scene three. <laughs> Where have you been, sister? <laughs> Killing swine. Sister, and you? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, said I. Be gone, witch, the swill-fed swinelet cries. Her husband sailed to Aleppo, captain of the tiger. But in a sieve, I'll follow his sail and like a horny rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do him. Uh, I'll give you a wine. How kind. And I another. I myself have all the other. Fan the very ports they blow and all the places that they know from, this, from their sailing chart. I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep won't come in night or day to hang upon his swollen lids. Cursed, he'll let a man forbid. <laughs> Not sleeping for nine weeks times nine. He'll dwindle, peak, and then he'll pine. Though his boat will not be lost, still it will be tempest tossed. Look what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a captain's thumb, wrecked as homeward oh. he did come. <laughs> a drum, a drum, Macbeth does come. We'll come with sisters, hand in hand. Oh. Let us spin about. About three to you, three to me. And thrice more towards destiny. Peace, the spell is spun. Oh, thank you all. Uh, Migdala, how was that experience for you? Hearing, you know, your translated work, like did, did um, it, it change from the first time you hear it or was it different? Uh, was it a different experience now? Well, it's always different with different actors. I think what, what these three um, beautiful women brought to it was uh, a, sense of, a, a sense of enjoyment of the language and a playfulness that's, that's really cool. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and a confidence in one's power. Like I felt like in, in, in both scenes, I felt that all three actors really brought um, um, what would that word be? Something um, courageous and but and also uh, in in forward facing. I think often you think about women being hidden. You think about the way and the way Shakespeare first wrote the witches, them sort of being sort of in the shadows and looking haggy and hanging around with beards and being like you know freaky deeks off in the woods and everyone being afraid of them. Um, and I think people are afraid of a lot of things that are actually really beautiful because they don't spend time uh, with those things or they, they think they already have something figured out and they get surprised or by their, either their attraction or their beauty or, or, or their rightfulness. Like they look at and, and the things that the witches say are, are right on. So, um, so that was my reaction. I thought it was cool and I thought it was really good. <laughs> Um, I'm not talking about my own work. I'm talking about their work and interpreting interpreting these these beings. 
that are you know, sort of hyper hyper women. And I may, and in the translation, I wanted to make them very um, um, sex positive and and body positive and power positive, um, and really taking any any hint of uh, coyness away from them. There's no, they're not coy, and they're not necessarily subtle. They are, they are who they are. So I felt like that was that was clear. So that was cool to watch. I did really want to turn off my video because I hate when people see my face while I'm watching my own work. And then I'm like, you know, making weird faces. It has nothing to do with what's happening. It's all about what's happening inside my crazy head. But um, uh, but that was great. I enjoyed it. Yeah, and um, looking forward to hearing yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, well put together. <laughs> And the world that you're creating, the, the framework you're giving to it, that's so beautiful. Yeah, it was so lovely to see. And um, I wanted to ask Jasmine, Jessica, Marissa, what was the process of transforming into a witch? Like, what did you imagine the witch to be? How did you bring yourself into character? Um, yeah, anyone can start. So for me, it's finding, I'm a big music human. So it's finding a playlist for her. Uh, just because like with my own personal algorithm, I find a lot of like just healing from triggers and my rituals and how I create all of that somehow has a song to it. So it's just finding which two's like rhythm and her cadence. And I try to find, um, I guess, period appropriate music, a lot of like jazzy things and one song, which I don't even think it's truly period, is uh, Nina Simone's uh, No Me Quiten Pas Mas. Oh, the French is bad, y you feel me? But uh, just <laughs> forgive me. But, uh, but I, I think that like in her song, I'm able to find like the witch's voice and like how low does it sit in my stomach? Um, and then as well as like that balance of like, she's sultry, but she's like a mature sultry. And yeah, so. For me, it's music. Music helps me find the human. Yeah. Yeah, and also chanting is kind of have kind of has a musical quality too. Did you did you think about like chanting that to go along with which two? Or yeah, the director actually wants us to sing in it. I, I wasn't really down for the singing first because I'm scared, but yeah, it does help to find the the chat and the chant. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Marissa, Jasmine, any any thoughts? Uh, sure. Uh, so it was interesting and also just very different than other characters that I've ever worked on uh, were the stakes. So in each scene, I felt like I knew how this would play out. You know, it's exciting to watch. Everything's going according to my plan. And there isn't that much resistance to, you know, the plan unfolding. Um, what I want each scene is being fulfilled. Uh, there aren't any really hiccups where I need to like change my tactics to get what I want until, uh, what, what pronunciation do we agree on? Was it Hecate? Hecate. Go with whichever one. Go with whichever one. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Um, right. until... Hecate, <laughs> oh no, I think I did not, does not sound right, um, until Hecate shows up. And uh, that to me was really interesting within the context of the play uh, because that to me feels like, because the, the witch has, the witch three who I play has power and the only time when I need to like up the stakes or I have fear that I may not get what I want is when another being with similar or more power uh, arrives. And even though we're talking the context of like supernatural powers, this is something that I'm like, oh, like I just thinking about characters and power dynamics, period, right? And thinking about that and like, that's definitely gonna, you know, influence how I approach uh, other characters in the future but that to me was really fascinating because I was like wow I've never like all the characters I normally play are like you know like give me what I deserve please <laughs> like you know like I need this and it was just so refreshing to have a character that was like great every you know like I guess sitting in their power right and like 
again, everything's going according to plan. Um, but what it does make it interesting is that there is that hiccup, right? Of like, oh, it, it you know, there, there has to be some stakes here. There has to be um, some sort of change of tactics to still get what I want. So that was an interesting journey. And I'll say that uh, over like the last, I'd like to say six to seven months, I've been on this journey of like sex positivity, body positivity. So I've been buying like a lot of lingerie and getting sexy for myself and like really understanding what what is like alluring about oneself. What is like, what makes one sexual? And is that more based on like the sexual attraction of others or is that like your own sexual energy? that you just naturally breathe and can evoke whenever you choose. So it's kind of like, I can turn on and off my sexy. And I think that's one of the things I've been trying to really deal with here is like kind of that scary power in knowing that you're sexy. Like there is something extremely intimidating by a person who knows that I can be sexy I am sexy, I am a sexual being. And you can't stop that. That's not based off of like whether you find me attractive. That's just something I know about myself. Mm -hmm. um, so these, these women are, they, they stand in their power and they don't have to make it demure for anyone else just because like it, it, that's what's acceptable or what makes other people comfortable. They're like, no, I am sexual, I'll do him. And I don't have a problem with that. Like I, I'll, I'll, like, I'll drain him dry. Like you say that kind of thing and people are like, oh, you're being cocky or you're just like, they're like, no, it's just a fact. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's something that makes me like very excited to just sit in that and then also like decide to take that off a bit. Like, okay, that was a lot, that was a lot. Let's just sit back on yeah. it. But yeah, it's, it's great. It's great to just be in that power. Yeah. And speaking of body positively, like I think, Part of it is to be more in tune with your body um, when, you know, when accessing that sexual energy. So did, did you have to consider, like, as part of your character, like, what, like, movements or, or what, what body you're leading from? Like, did you have to consider that when becoming a witch? And Miguel, you can tune in, too. Like, did you think about, like, what movements the characters have? in order to, I don't know, get, be a part of, yeah, to get into character, basically. Sorry, I'm going to jump in just to provide a little bit of context, because I realize yeah. I don't know if any of us shared this, but the three witches, well, all four witches in the play, um, under this, you know, supervision of our director, Tia James, we decided that uh, they would be, you know, it takes place in the 1930s, and they're ladies of the night, they're prostitutes. Um, if that wasn't already clear. Okay. I did not know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, for me, because, like, we're on Zoom, sometimes, like, when you're seated, you're stunted, and you're like, oh, my God, I can't access anything. But, and call me crazy. Like, before I come here, I'm like, all right, are you, are you that bitch or not? Are you, like, if you're going to step in this, you have to decide right now if you are. So I get my kettlebell, and I start doing like weights and I'm like, you know what? This butt is gonna look great. No one's gonna see it, but you're gonna feel it. Like throw on some cute like underwear. You're, nobody else knows but you. So like, then I can just like sit in my hips and enjoy that. So when I have breaks or have moments, I'm like, hmm, bend down, really like touch your legs. Like, where is this power coming from? Is it coming from like the ground up? Like, yeah, no, okay, yeah, just to see what feels sexy that day. Cause some days it might be an elbow and that might be like the sexiest elbow I've ever seen in my entire life. And other days it might be like my hips and then others, it might be my neck. So it's just like exploring and really taking the time out that day in that moment to think about what feels sexy and access it. I like that you said that because for me, Finding my sexy looks like reminding myself to stay open physically because I always get the note of you're hiding yourself, like just naturally, like I just kind of find ways to 
find a prop. Even now, I wore glasses so I could hide behind them. And being the witch, it's like, sis does not hide. And then following their lead, it's like, yeah, we can't hide. So every time I feel myself closing up, I got to like open up and find a little sexy piece of something. So, yeah. Cool. Also, um, I want to touch on something that I just find that's like really wonderful about the three witches is just their relationship to each other. Um, I think, you know, for, for me, like in rehearsals, like it has felt really playful. It has felt like we are supporting each other in this. Um, and that's always exciting is like, you know, women supporting women. That's, you know, always sexy to me. (laughs) So, yeah. Well, and McDowell, anything to add? Well, I was just, I didn't really think about their body so much as their eyes and their mouths. So I sort of feel like the witches have um, have this kind of power of hypnotism too. Like they can, they can like look at you and you, and they make you, um, it's not that they turn you to stone like Medusa or something like that, but they, but they hold your attention just by a glance that they have power that is so much uh, in the, so much centered, I think, and also in their third eye that there's like this, like their fate, just to look upon their face is to, is to enter like a different world. And I think I thought about that when I was writing a lot. And I also have soundtracks for all of my, but when I write any play, actually, I was gonna say to J-Rock that I do that same thing where I, I find soundtracks for all my characters. Um, and that's how I write them. Like I put that on while I'm writing them so that I can feel like they feel their music while I'm finding them. But yeah, yeah it all sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah really and cool. also just just to give um a little more context so uh, what Mithali, can you explain what 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 was the process of translating the shakespeare play for you like i just well, so that yeah mm-hmm. i think that the um well there were there were there were many processes i think i mean first of all I was agreeing to do it in the first place when everybody was like, are you fucking crazy? Why do you want to even do that? He's a dead white man. What, what, are, you, what are you going to say that's going to be relevant um, to what he's already done? Why would you want to make it relevant? And, uh, and I felt like I wanted to make it relevant because it needed to not keep being done in the same old way, that we needed to be able to understand those words and as a writer, I thought it was really exciting to just take on the challenge of trying to make sense of what he was doing now, you know, and not have to read 25 lexicons in order to understand what it was. Like I wanted actors to be able to look at the text and say, oh, I get it. This is what this is emotionally, as opposed to saying, oh, I got to look up that history. <laughs> I got to find out what that word means. I got to know how to pronounce things instead of all of those things being even a part of it that it was really about how do I make these people come alive and tell a story. And for me, the story of Macbeth is the story of, of people who are othered. And, uh, and I feel like that's what I've been in my whole life, right? As a New Yorkan living in the South Bronx and coming from poverty, I've always been othered and always been told, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't rise that far. You can't say no to that man. You can't, and all the things that we go through in our lives where, where you're always sort of uh, just assume that you can't possibly um, challenge another person, particularly another male person, uh, and particularly another white person, I felt like I needed to challenge all those things and that it would be fun. And I thought, well, nobody's going to produce this. (laughs) So just do what you feel like doing. And I thought that particular story, because of what it is, it's a love story. It's two people who, have, who are childless, who've tried to have children, who have no legacy that is going to allow them to rise in their culture. And they have to fight their way into, into their place, their rightful place on that throne. And I say rightful because I feel like, you know, of all the people in the play, the, you know, Macbeth is the one who is the bravest, who's fought the most, who's literally been the fighter for his country. But then when it comes time to being, you know, applauded for that, or given the highest accolade, right, to be given the throne, he cannot do it. He doesn't have, because he doesn't, first of all, he doesn't have children. And what does that mean to his wife and to their family? 
But what does it mean to have a miscarriage? And that also uh, weigh on Lady Macbeth and, and, and their voyage. And I also had a miscarriage. So I feel like those things that, uh, you know, when you have a life and you lose it, and you almost had that, because uh, children are always this sort of symbol of hope, right? That suddenly you, you almost had that and then you didn't have it. And what does it do to your body as a woman? And what does it do to your uh, anger? <laughs> So I said, I understand Macbeth's rage. I understand Lady Macbeth's uh, wanting this for him and for her, a, a way of saying, I exist, look at us, we are here and we deserve this and get out of our way, it's our time. Because I think also people who are other all the time uh, get filled with rage. That's like the story of my life and my whole family uh, and my whole neighborhood, it's like, you know, uh, can't tell you how many people in my neighborhood, you know, ended up incarcerated or dead, right? So I feel like, okay, there's a reason why we 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 get to that place, and uh, and for me, it's I have always felt that it's this idea of what, uh, which is represented in Macbeth so poetically. You know, what happens when you have the other try to rise? What do you? What happens to those people who go above their station, whatever that station is? Who determines one station, and 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 once you 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 commit a crime or commit a, you make a commitment, let's say to to a certain path. Sometimes you can't back out. You know, it's like I don't know. It's uh, it's it. You suddenly feel yourself on this roller coaster. It's like I have to follow it through because now I've I've created my destiny, and I and if I don't follow through, what happens then? That all of it was for nothing. Um, so I really understood. I felt like I understood uh, the Macbeths, <laughs> and I also felt like I needed to, you know, pay homage to him. So part of my process was I went to visit his grave in in Scotland. I went to visit Shakespeare's grave. I was like. I think I felt like I needed to be respectful of them as people and then uh, and then uh, and in turn respectful of the characters. So I created altars for all of my characters or soundtracks or um, um, so that I felt like I was I was doing like um, due diligence in my work as a playwright to 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 really honor who they were, who they are and who they will become in the 21st century. And perhaps who they are in all of us, right? And also just to, you know, like the thing I've fought my whole life for uh, as a writer is this entitlement to poetry. Who is entitled to poetry? And I feel like people of color are always put down and, and said, you know, and told that we're not entitled to this because, I, and I think it's mainly poor people of color that we feel like um, um, we're not part of this thing that is so beautiful that is poetry but we make our own poetry and, and we should feel proud of the poetry that we make. So that, so I felt that there was, you know, it was a good, it was a good thing to do. It felt like it was part of what I was already doing. Um, and that if people didn't like it, that was okay too. I didn't feel like, um, I didn't feel like I could be hurt by doing this. Although a lot of my friends who were playwrights were like, well, you know, you're going to be attacked for doing this. People are going to say, you know, you don't have any right to do it. And I was like, well, right on. Then that's why I should do it. Why should I stop myself from doing anything, really? You know, at this point in my life, it's like, Jesus, how do you, how do you continue on calling yourself an artist when you, you just stop taking risks? And it felt risky to me in a weird way. And I was like, I think I can do this. And as soon as I understood, you know, their, um, the, their viscera, of the characters, I felt like that was the thing I could, um, I wanted to address and that I could address. And uh, so that was part of my process. And I mean, I did look at all those lexicons. I, you know, I don't know how many damn books I have about Shakespeare. I read every single one. I'm sure I've forgotten most of what's in all of them. But at the time when I was translating, it's like I really poured over them. I went, I translated word by word, scene by scene. Uh, I went through the histories of, of uh, Scotland at the time. I went through the histories of Shakespeare when he was writing these, this play. And, uh, and uh, I tried to understand the jokes and tried to make them more modern, right, for the porter. So it's like try, trying to clarify the way for a modern audience was not just, uh, you know, 
making it so that simple people can read it. That was so not the, the idea. The idea was to make it viable and actable and, uh, and answer uh, and uh, refer to the 21st century you know, person who is going to be listening to this play and making sure that all of it includes, you know, as many as possible people of color, because for me, that's the future of the world. Because if that's not, then I'm not in the future. <laughs> One time I wrote an opera with this guy. Oh my God. And, uh, and I saw, I wanted to write about a Puerto Rican astronaut. I mean, it's like, well, that's impossible. I was like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, there won't be Puerto Ricans in space. I thought, if there's space, <laughs> there's going to be Puerto Ricans in space. I'm sorry. And this the idea that he, he thought it was OK to say that to me. And this was a, a young white man, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. Puerto Ricans are going to be we're going to be around. <laughs> you may not identify us immediately. We may come in all different colors and, and all different creeds and, and genders and, uh, you know, and sexualities. But we are going to be there because we are part of the human landscape. So that's why I did it. That was a long winded way to say that, but I think that it's like almost all the questions about why the hell translate Shakespeare, you know? Yeah, I love that. Um, and I love what you said about how Macbeth is a play about being othered and how we have this entitlement to poetry because we haven't had our voices heard in so long. Um, and, um, but, but Mackers is a play full of BIPOC women. And I want to ask, like, how does having a cast full of BIPOC women change as opposed to, you know, Shakespeare's time when it was all white men? Um, uh, specifically in, in the scene with Macbeth and Banquo, like, how does it change with an all BIPOC women cast as opposed to, like, interacting with men? I feel like to me, especially watching the scenes, it feels like mirror images of one another fighting themselves or like, you know, how like you do things that make you, or some people do things that make them feel like they're dying on the inside. It kind of feels like that to me, watching uh, folks kill each other and plot against each other. It just feels uh, so much deeper and uh, feels more, uh, triggering is not the right word, but I, I feel immediately like there's there's danger here by the fact that they're feuding and it's not going to end well. And I'm already nervous and I'm just like, everybody, please calm down. Like the danger and suspense is there more than if I watched like a, a group of white men do it. I was like, oh, okay. You guys are gonna argue about something. Uh, I guess, you know, y'all, you're, you're gonna kill. I guess it's what you're gonna do. But here it's like, there's hope that it won't turn out that way. Like nobody has to die here, but still someone does. Many people do. So yeah. Um, in one of our rehearsals, we talked about, um, you know, had the discussion of there's a lot of violence in this play. And, um, you know, as people of color, um, what do we think about like people of color violence against other people of color? And that kind of brought up um, like, well, why does it happen in the first place? And like, for me, it's, you know, I think it's systemic oppression, right? It's like cis, white, male patriarchy that, um, that that's the system and people of color are always pitted against one another because we're battling in the system. Um, so I, I, I'm curious like what audiences might think when looking at that, um, but also knowing that it's not, it's no fault of their own, <laughs> you know, it's because of the system that people of color have been, have been in, um, that it's, it's almost like there's a deprivation of resources, right? Um, when, when people, um, don't have access to resources, rage can happen, violence can happen. So it's like, well, when these resources aren't allocated um, 
I don't know, evenly, <laughs> but we'll, we'll say that, but um, are allocated fairly, um, then, you know, this is what happens. Um, the people that are, that don't have these resources are gonna be fighting against other people that don't have access to these resources. Um, but we should be looking at who does have these resources and who does have access to them, um, that that is why there's, you know, this systemic violence in place. Um, first of all, amen to everything that was said prior to me. And it's kind of like a, in like blackity black films where everyone's black. So it's finally like, now we can take the big ass sign that says we're black out of the show and just focus on plot and focus on character arts and just development, developing a story outside of race. So in this setting, it feels like as people of color, as indigenous people, we're able to finally just take a breath and just let the story live, if that makes sense. You know, and then especially as like them identifying women um, of color, I feel like we don't really have access to feelings that are associated with fragility. So being able to like showcase sensitive and vulnerable, but angry and sexy and confused and heartbroken and lost and mourning, like being able to experience all of these things as the quote unquote, like villains, usually the witches or like these things that are associated with evil, seeing it from the perspective of like a mother who lost her child. Like there's, I guess I just, I love the fact that BIPOC people in this play are able to feel every goddamn thing. Like, I feel like every emotion, every instance is touched on, especially in scenes with Banquo. So you have this masculine energy, but it's presented through like this, this form of like a feminine body. And it's just, just, it's just hella wavy. I don't know how to describe it. I hope that makes sense. Help. And I feel like it makes so much sense in the context, like Nadal, you were talking about how you understood Lady M's rage. And I was like, I, every time I, she gets to the part where she's like, come unsex me. Like these spirits, when she calls on the spirits, I'm like, this woman is so like just fed up and so pissed off at nature itself that she is beckoning demons and spirits to come remove this female body of hers to get what she needs to get done. And like, we get to see like a whole bunch of other female identified and non-binary folks really sit in that without like a male presence there while we all understand what that means. Like if I could just unsex myself, I might be able to get the job done. Like just remove this. And it's so, it's so relatable to, to see that and to feel that and not have to have like the male gaze watching it and be like, oh, well, what is she actually, shut up. Everybody knows it's un, like it's unspoken. We don't have to harp on it or we don't, we just innately feel it or we innately feel like what it means to be a person of color and being a woman also say that. Like we just know it's, it's amazing. It's, it's freeing. It's inspiring just to watch that and to hear that. Not even like to really be involved in it, just, just to be a witness to it. Um, is something that I'm so excited for other people to see. And I, I feel so grateful to see myself. It's just like, no, like, it's just, J-Rock, you were right, it's wavy. It's wavy as shit. It's wavy. Yeah. Um, Dahlia, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, this is the first time it's being done by 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 all women. Mm -hmm. So I am so anxious to see like the dynamics, you know, like like y'all were describing already that what what changes and what what's heightened in that moment because of it. I'm just I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> I might be the only one, but I am. I really want to see what um, what what you've wrought because it's sort of like. Um, I don't know. There, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of. There's going to be a lot of shorthand, like you don't usually have in a play. Like you, you know, like where you get to the the heart of what it is quickly, you get to the viscera of it quickly, 
and it is not like it's not in, a, in an intellectual place anymore. It is really just like you know, from you know from your depths and then out through your mouths and your eyes and whatever else you have. And if you have your hand extended and there's a knife in it, who do you kill with it? It's like all of it's going to be like uh, it's like punctuated. I think in this this kind of this is what I'm. Uh, I think it will be because I've only been part of. Um, um, of, of one rehearsal, like at the very beginning. So I'm just, I'm so excited just to see what, what happens. I think it's gonna be, for, and for me, it'll be fantastic. It'll, it's gonna be such a beautiful sort of a, a reclam, reclamation, I think, of language and of space by women of color in, 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 a, in a play that traditionally is so masculine. It's like, you know, you walk around, you're supposed to hear people's balls clank because it's so masculine or something. It's all about, you know, who has the biggest dick or who has the biggest gun. And that's not necessarily who wins the war, right? The, who wins the war are the people who actually understand that, the, uh, uh, understand family and, and generosity and kindness, and then still have to fight to get those things sort of uh, become part of the, the world. So what am I saying? I went off on some bizarre tangent, but it's what I think it's about. It's about I'm excited to see this happen. I think it's going to be fantastic to to uh, to see all these women. I remember when I first got the phone call from uh, Black Girls Love the Bar, and I was like, "That is just a fantastic name for a company." And who are they? And and why do they love the Bard? Especially if it hasn't been translated. And I was like, you know, what 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 does the Bard bring to all of us? How do you find your way in? And uh, is it just about doing those great roles? Because I also think it's about embodying those great feelings, the feelings of war, the feelings of that, that you know, that men shut us out from all the time, of uh, the conquering, the, the, the great lovers, the great, you know, they're always men. Why? <laughs> and, and the ones who die, of course, are the women. They're tragic and beautiful and frail. Like if you look at like Hamlet, um, poor Ophelia, I was just so bad for Ophelia. Um, mm -hmm. But but you know, but but what is Hamlet, right? He's like a weird, whiny guy, and it's like, what is what is his power? Why can't we take it back, and 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 make them real? Which means making like he. I mean, in Shakespeare's time, he had women, men playing women. So maybe that's why all of his women are a little bit weird and frail and caricatured, <laughs> or like you know, they're extremes. Um, but now there's the chance, right? Where, because we're in the 21st century, our chance to just make them, make them us. And what does that do to us? I wanted to ask what, how has the modern day witch changed since Shakespeare's time? Like, obviously we're talking, when you guys were talking about what, what does spirituality mean to you, we mentioned family, resilience, protection. How has it changed since, since back then? Well, I think now we acknowledge that they've, they're more than that. I think in Shakespeare's time, they were, they were just weird creatures to be feared and, 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 and bur murdered basically. Let's burn them. Let's build the bridge out of them. What is it? What are all the stupid things that people say about witches? Um, because they are afraid that they'll lose their power if somebody else, especially a woman, has more power than them. You know, how many women get abused by their husbands because he gets afraid of her power, because she takes care of the children, because he sees the nurturer that he will never be, and he like wants to kill it, or he wants to destroy it, or he only wants it. Uh, presented to him as opposed to the child and it's uh it, it's so deep how that um how that pain goes through our lives of how do we deal with men <laughs> and how do they deal with us um and these fears so i think in, in shakespeare's time it was very simple you if you witch you kill them <laughs> you see a healing woman you kill her because she might have a little bit too much power than the local doctor does who's filling you with leeches and and other things to cure you whereas the the healing woman uses herbs and who knows about herbs 
but they know about herbs because their grandmother knew about herbs and their grandmother knew about herbs. And it's about legacy and trial and error with herbal medicine, right? Whereas the modern doctor comes from a quack. <laughs> These guys that were like, you know, making people bleed, cutting into them, doing all kinds of things that were not sensible or, or anything like healing or more like harming. So I don't know. So Shakespeare didn't really understand witches, I don't think. <laughs> Not at all the way we do. And certainly, like I, like I said at the very beginning, you know, for me, it's witches are like family. It's, it's about women who are really strong, who control, <laughs> who control the kitchen, and, but also control sort of your life and your, your well-being and make you understand how you walk in the world and not get harmed by other people, in particular men. So, uh, I don't know. I don't think he knew anything about it. Shakespeare didn't understand women, so he would never understand witches. Like, that is just way too above his pay grade. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to get it. Um, yeah, for me, uh, I also feel like um, the concept of a witch today to me is, you know, out, out speaking outside of the realm of religion um, is a woman who is capable, clever, uh, intuitive, and so strong that I think originally, like as Magdalene was saying, uh, scared men into somewhat dehumanizing them, right? So when you give someone qualities that aren't human per se, you create the other, uh, and then, therefore, you can justify horrific crimes against them, uh, you know, such as, you know, throughout the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, um, there was this um, manual that, uh, because of the printing press, it like spread through wildfire throughout Europe of, of um, detailing like witchcraft and like how to, um, how to tell if someone is a witch. Um, like I was reading this article, let me see, uh, I think it was written by Juliana Classens, um, and she talks about this manual, and um, it was how to recognize and interrogate witches, and uh, it was called, well, you know, I don't even want to say the name of it, because I don't even want to give power to it, <laughs> but in this manual, um, they, like, here's an excerpt from it, uh, but the natural reason is that she is more carnal than a man, as is clear from her many carnal abominations. And it should be noted that there was a defect in the formation of the first woman, since she was formed from a bent rib, that is a rib of the breast, which is bent as it were in the contrary direction to a man. And since through this defect, she is an imperfect animal, she always deceives. So that was in the manual to like help like, people figure out or help justify horrific crimes toward what they deemed as witches. Um, and this manual, uh, which also, I, I'm, su I'm sure some of you have probably heard before, like one of the ways you can tell someone is a witch uh, was if you put them in water and if they were floating, then that's, you know, sorcery, you have to burn them or, something um, because they must be a witch to float in water. Um, that was like one of the tests that they would need to do. Um, and it led to, to a, what they estimate to be 200,000 women that were then accused of witchcraft, uh, tortured, hanged, burned, um, just from this manual going across Europe. But there is a positive to this story. And that is in a small town in the Netherlands, um, I'm going to probably mispronounce it, but Udewater, I think was the name of the town. And this was the only town that they know that resisted these harmful superstitions. Um, so one of the beliefs, right, was that witches need to be light enough in order to fly on a broom. So they would weigh women that are suspected of witchcraft. So the king of that region in the Netherlands uh, actually gave the town permission to issue certificates to women attesting to their weight and hence their innocence. So, you know, it is said in that little town, not a single woman was ever convicted of witchcraft. So, you know, even within there, there is rebellion <laughs> to this, you know, absurdity in this, these crimes. Um, but 
again, I'll go back to the question because now I've gone off on a tangent. Uh, I think this concept of a witch is still prevalent today, right? I think today people still find ways to other women, women that might not fit within these stereotypical categories uh, that are powerful, that you know stand, stand and own their power. I think people try to annihilate them in other ways. Um, so I think that's, that's still that process of, in some ways, dehumanizing, right? In order to then like justify being able to annihilate them or um, say terrible things about them. I think that still exists today. The persistent systemic violence against women. I think a modern day witch is somebody who carries crystals. Um, I think a lot of these like crystal loving people, they're witches and they don't know it or they don't want to admit it yet. And that's perfectly fine. Um, whichever way you come to it is your way. Uh, tarot cards, we can also say calling upon spirits or calling upon like ancestors. That's that's what witchcraft, modern day witchcraft in my mind is. Or like, I know in my family, we come from folks that put roots on folks. Um, that's like an old, old thing is when you put a root on someone, something bad might happen and you have to go to somebody else to get rid of it. It's kind of blended in with Christianity a little bit. It's like, go pray on a Bible to, t to get a root off. Whoa, this is a lot. Um, so it's, there's so many like different, um, ways to witchcraft now in my mind. And I think witchcraft is just coming back to the earth, coming back to like the center, coming back to nature coming back to, I don't know, the thing that binds us all together. Um, Migali, you're talking about family a lot. And I'm like, yeah, it's just seeing where we're rooted and how we're interconnected. Um, so whatever centers you is that plants, like really tending to something, watching it grow, watching, you know, how your spirit can lead something else to grow and nurture. Like it's, it's all witchcraft and it's all beautiful and it's all powerful and it's all wonderful. And I just think, I would really love more people to accept the fact that they're witches and we can all just be witches together and dance in the woods naked. Um, I think that's the best part of witchcraft in my mind, but we'll get to that point one day. And I like that Migdalia said that it's hypernatural because for me, I just think I perceive modern day witches as these beings who have tapped into their personal algorithm so damn much, tapped into all that natural goodness that comes from the root, that comes from the earth, that comes from the water, that comes from everything around us what we've access to, to the point that it intimidates other people. So they see that this heightened being, this elevated being, which is a good thing, as this toxic entity that has to be like condemned because it has too much power and there's not enough for the rest of us. And it's like, bitch, if you would just sit still and listen to like, the, the space around you, you too could tap into this ethereal shit, but you're not ready. So I feel that. It's like, it's an intimidation. I don't know. Wow, well, thank you everyone. Um, so I think we're nearing the end of our conversation. So I'm just gonna ask one final question to wrap things up. Um, I love what you all said about, um, for example, Jasmine, you said that witches are rooted and grounded and they're very natural. And it seems like witches, they also have an element of truth to them. Like they, they tell the truth to Macbeth and Banquo. Um, and yet there's still an element of disbelief and distrust with them. So, well, so my question is why, why is there so much shame and punishment revolving them? Like why is there that disbelief? And yet they, they are the ones who are, you know, the most truthful and also connected to nature. Nobody wants to hear a woman speak the truth. I mean, we see that all the time. Nobody, nobody wants to hear that uh, because some reason, I mean, just like Marissa was saying, there's always somehow that we're trying to deceive people. We're trying to trick people. We're trying to seduce. We're trying to entice by our very beings. We're just always trying to lead you down a path of destruction. So there's no way that what we're saying is actually the truth. It's like, if you turn left, something bad will happen. They're like, ah, 
you're trying to lead me towards something that no i'm actually trying to avert you from that but because you already perceive me as a lying a, like a deceitful and lying creature not even a person i, I can't change that um so i just think it's deeply rooted in a lot of uh fear that women will say the truth and one day you'll have to believe us and trust us and know that we will not we're not leading anyone towards destruction because what would that do for us but come on let's keep being led by men um that's turned out great for us thank you <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, just to piggyback off of that is the packaging. You know, at the end of the day, you don't want to, I, I guess they don't want to see their reflection and see how much of them is in us. We're just more evolved. Like we just, we really are. I think that's why a lot of women and or why a lot of men or masculine energies are intimidated by women who just know what the fuck we just know. Like it just, it's innate. Like, and it intimidates, it intimidates them because it's like, you know, how could you know? How do you, you have to explain to us. And it's like, baby, we speak two different languages. Even if, even if I explain in my language, you won't, you don't have access to these words. Just trust me. But that's a lot to ask of people. Mm. I think men are just scared of losing their power. I think there's a scarcity complex there. I think it's like, I can't share any of this power because then I'll lose it. And I'm scared because I'm on top and I just want to stay there because that's all I've ever known. Um, so I think it's just a lot of fear of losing their own status and where they are and in society. And um, I think any woman that is just a woman or just like challenging the patriarchy or the status quo in any way, uh, they're like, they're going to be like, I don't, I don't think I can trust this person <laughs> because I think, I think there's a fear that they're going to come for them. Like they're going to come for men and they're going to take the power from them. So I think there's going to be that distrust of like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Also, and there's also often like, how many meetings have you been to when you've said something and everybody go, oh, well, that's an interesting idea. But what about if we do this? And they'll say exactly what you just said. And it's a man says, and everybody goes, oh, that's such an amazing idea. That's so brilliant. How did you come up with that? I, that happens to me all the time in meetings. I always feel like, am I crazy? Why, why do they have to why can't they just say, hey, that's a good idea? Why, why is it so difficult to listen to someone because they have breasts <laughs> or, or, or present female in whatever way they present female? There's such a challenge to, to, to the male gaze to, to, to hear words out of the female. <clears throat> I have this theory because I, I remember reading, I read, uh, there's, I read a lot about Mary Magdalene. And uh, how when she, uh, because people sometimes say she was like Jesus's girlfriend, they actually had a, a children, they, they actually had an affair and she, and she then she fled with the children all around Europe. And so there's a cult of Mary. And that cult of Mary is about, um, about worshiping the woman who carries the children. There is the oldest cult figure in Africa that was ever found is of a woman who's pregnant that famous figurine that uh, which is like you know teeny little head and a giant pregnant body that figure of a woman it was was so they used it as signs of like witchcraft except originally that was what was worshipped so at some point somebody said hey if we you know we can't have children so let's take away their power <laughs> because you know without them we won't have a society but if we let them lead then we have no place. So somehow, I don't know how to make that, how to get rid of that fear, but without, without us having an equal sort of basis with men, then there's, we'll never get rid of that fear. 
So I just feel like, what happened to us? What happened to humanity? You know, that um, we feared that we men fear menstruation, right? There's all kinds of religions where women have to like separate themselves from the men when they're menstruating and wash themselves in holy baths and all these things to, to make themselves cleanse themselves. Cleanse themselves of the reason they're here in the first place that we're all here, which is childbirth, you know. I don't know, it's all so powerful and I have no answers for how you fix that, <laughs> except that it is frustrating. And it's something that, you know, that this play I think really talks about when we, we think about Lady M and her and her miscarriage and her and, and her rise to power with her husband and how and how their love then becomes sort of uh, perverted for her, how she, it leads her to suicide. Why did it do that? Why did she lose her mind? Was it the guilt of, of having killed someone who looked like her father? Or was it because she killed the seed of power and that made her crazy? Like what, what, what happened in her brain that, that changed and why did she feel, or was it the death of, of Banquo and possibly Fleance? You know, we don't kill children. We'll kill, we kill men. We don't kill children. <laughs> it's like, well, what's the difference? If you begin killing a family, you kill a family. So I think that play is such a, a microcosm of everything that's both right and wrong with this world in so many ways. And um, one of the ways I tried to maybe help fix that was giving the riches power and making them frame the play in a way that was modern and, uh, and progressive and and truth telling and fun, you know, that, that they, they, they see this world and, and they understand that they're the ones who are going to create the next thing because next king, because literally women create kings, <laughs> you know, kings don't come out of men's legs. So how do you, how do you find, so finding a, finding a framework for me was really important. That was, that was powerful for women around it and particularly women of color. So. That's uh, yeah. that's how I'd answer that. Well, I think that's a great way to end. Um, thank you so much for everyone's insightful comments and thoughts. I, I really enjoyed being a part of this discussion. Um, thank you so much to Jessica, Marissa, Jasmine, the three witches of Mackers, and Magdalia, who's the translator of Macbeth. Um, yeah, I, I'm really honored to be a part of this space. Um, so what is so the much. time again? It's, uh, so it's on Thursday night, right? 8 p.m. Yes. Yeah. So the live virtual reading is this Thursday, 8 p.m. on the Black Girls Love the Bar YouTube. So tune in for that. Um, and this was a beautiful conversation.